Today's reflections have been focused on a difficult yet central teaching in the Christian faith. Loving our enemies is a command that strikes at the core of our humanity because it feels counterintuitive to our natural instincts. When we are hurt, insulted, or mistreated, the immediate, immediate reaction is often one of defense, anger, or even vengeance. Yet, Christ calls us to something higher, something more profound, to love those who hate us, to pray for those who persecute us. As we explore this, a number of important questions arise. Why is this command so important? How does it align with God's nature? And what do we do when our enemies refuse to change? In Matthew 5.44, Jesus gives a command that turns worldly wisdom on its head. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This isn't a suggestion, but a command that mirrors God's own heart toward us. This command reminds us that before we came to Christ, we too were once enemies of God through sin. Yet, God didn't treat us as we deserved. Romans 5.8 reminds us that God commended His love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus showed the ultimate example of loving His enemies when He gave His life on the cross. The reason we are called to love our enemies is because it reflects God's grace. It's a display of the same mercy that we have been shown. Loving our enemies is not about condoning evil or allowing others to harm us. Instead, it's about offering grace, forgiveness, and hope for reconciliation, just as Christ did for us. When we love those who don't love us back, we reveal the transformative power of God's love, a love that goes beyond human logic and reflects the divine. This brings us to an important distinction between God's enemies and ours. While we are called to love our enemies, Satan, as God's enemy, is beyond repentance. Satan represents a fully hardened rebellion against God. His fate is sealed, as we see in Revelation 20.10, where he will be cast into the lake of fire. This is not about lack of love from God, but about the reality of evil's final judgment. God's relationship with Satan is one of ultimate justice, not grace because Satan made an irrevocable decision to oppose God. The reason we are called to love our human enemies, even those who wrong us deeply, is that they are not beyond redemption. They still have the potential to repent, to change, and to come to God, even if that possibility seems remote. As long as a person is alive, there is the hope that they might be touched by God's grace, and perhaps the love and mercy we extend could be the catalyst for that transformation. However, we also explored a difficult question. What happens when your enemy doesn't repent, no matter how much love you show? This is perhaps one of the hardest parts of loving one's enemies. Jesus doesn't promise that everyone we love will change. In fact, he warns us that many will continue to persecute and hate us. So why love them if they won't change? The answer lies in our obedience to Christ and our trust in God's justice. Romans 12, 19 reminds us, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath for it. It is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. God will handle the final judgment. Our role is to act in love, knowing that we are accountable to God for how we respond to others. In Matthew 18, 15 to 17, Jesus outlines how we are to deal with those who wrong us and refuse to repent. If they reject multiple opportunities for reconciliation, then we are to treat them as a heathen man and a publican, meaning we are no longer required to maintain close fellowship with them. This is crucial loving our enemies. Doesn't mean we continue to subject ourselves to harm or injustice. We can maintain distance from those who refuse to change, but we are still called to pray for them, bless them, and leave the rest in God's hands. When we love our enemies, even if they do not repent, we are keeping our own hearts free from bitterness. 
bitterness and hatred can consume us if we allow ourselves to harbor unforgiveness. Loving our enemies releases us from that burden. It's not about making them feel good or rewarding their bad behavior. It's about keeping our own relationship with God pure and untainted by hatred or vengeance. In the end, we must remember that God is just, and while He extends mercy, He also executes judgment. Those who persist in wickedness and rebellion will face His righteous judgment. We are called to love, to forgive, to extend mercy, but we are also allowed to trust that God will handle ultimate justice. This understanding gives us peace. It allows us to love freely, knowing that the outcome is not in our control. Whether our enemy repents or not, we have done our part in showing God's love, and we can rest in the assurance that God will handle the rest. Today's reflection reminds me that loving one's enemy is not about being passive or weak. It is an act of great strength and faith. It requires us to trust in God's justice, to extend the same grace that has been given to us, and to guard our hearts against the destructive forces of hatred and bitterness. We love because God loved us first. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And we trust that, in the end, God's perfect justice will prevail. This is the beauty of the Christian walk. Though we face many challenges, we are called to a higher standard that reflects the very heart of God. As we move forward, may we remember that loving our enemies is not a burden, but a gift, both to them and to ourselves. And may we always trust that God's justice will reign in the end, even when the world feels full of darkness. In a world where shadows often fall, and enemies rise with a bitter call. We are asked to love, though hearts may break, to forgive, though wounds may ache. Christ loved us while we were lost, and for our sins He paid the cost. Now He calls us to do the same, to love our foes, to bless their name, but what if they don't turn? or see. The grace we offer, the mercy free, what if their hearts stay cold as stone, and they leave us hurt, abandoned alone? Still we love, for God commands, and trust our faith in His just hands, for vengeance is His, not ours to seek. Our call is to love. Though we feel weak, no, we don't condone the wrong they do, but rise above and stay steadfast and true. We offer grace as we've been shown, and trust in God's justice is alone. Though they may never repent or change, though their hearts remain distant, strange, our love frees us from hatred's chain, and keeps our hearts in God's domain. For love is strength, not weakness here. It casts away both doubt and fear. We love our foes, but God will decide. Their fate, their end, we leave aside. So in this world where darkness grows, we light the path though evil shows, for Christ has shown us how to live, to love, forgive, and always give.